This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it's time for Just for the Spell of It with the one and only Gary Moss. And I'm so glad that you are with us today because um, there's a lot of exciting things to talk about. Well, there always is are things to talk about. And um, yeah, I'm going to take us down a little different path today. Frequently, uh, people that I meet who enjoy Scrabble on their own have no idea at all that there are thousands, if not millions, of other Scrabble players all around the country, all around the world, and some just down the street. And uh, so people are very surprised when they find out that I've been running a club for over 30 years. And uh, you may have been in that predicament or spot sometime. Uh, what, what I recall is um, years ago, maybe more than 30 years ago, I went to a concert at Pine Knob, when I lived in Michigan, Pine Knob is uh, just north of Detroit. And it's one of those outdoor, outdoor concert venues. And um, the person that we were going to see that night is someone that I'd never heard of before, but someone said, oh, you've got to go to this concert. And so um, I liked, folk songs at that time. And I was told that this singer was like a storyteller in his uh, presentation. Okay. So I went to see Harry Chapin. And I had never heard of Harry Chapin. And the thing that really impressed me the most is when we drove into the venue the parking lot was totally filled. And I said, you know, how could this unknown person have this kind of response as far as an audience? And then when we got into the venue, I had fantastic seats. I had like 10th row center. And we had to crawl over people to get in. And I looked around and everybody was sitting there with a candle or with their uh, lighter, handheld yep. lighter. Yep. And all of these flames were all over. And they're waiting for him to come on stage. And it just blew my mind that here was somebody that was so popular and I didn't have a clue. So the same thing happens every time I meet one of these Scrabble players who don't have a clue that there are millions of other people out there down the street, all around the country, all across the world who have been playing Scrabble. And here this person has been in her home playing against relatives who don't want to play them anymore because this person is the better player and the other people have lost interest because they get beat all the time. And then the next step that is kind of equally amazing is when I invite this person to come to club and they're initially so excited about coming and then they come and they're unable to win a game. They think they're the best in the world because they've never played competitively with anyone that had Scrabble skills. And so that's sort of just mind boggling to me. And I think it's probably true in every uh, field. Um, as good as you are, if you really look to the experts in your field, you'll find people who are even better than you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it, it's really an uh, important lesson um, that has made me appreciate other people with 
other interests. Um, one of the first tournaments that I ever played in, uh, and again, this is when I was quite naive about how big the Scrabble world is. Uh, it was probably in the early 90s, and there was a tournament in Las Vegas. Okay. And I always loved to gamble playing blackjack. And so when I saw there was a Scrabble tournament in Las Vegas, how perfect is that for someone like me? where I can go and get my fill of Scrabble and also be able to play blackjack whenever I chose to while I was there. Sure. And uh, so I went to this tournament and first of all was the excitement of being in the room with 500 other Scrabble players. So there's over 250 Scrabble boards set up through the room and when the signal was given to begin to play you heard the sound of 250 scrabble tile bags oh, wow. with people's hands shaking the tiles and i just thought that was so incredible and there were people there from all over the u.s and beyond there were people from Canada and people from Israel and people from Thailand and people from the Caribbean. And who knew that there were people there that played Scrabble and that were playing with our dictionary. That was just totally amazing. And uh, in terms of people with other interests and other skills, on the last day of the tournament, uh, now I'm convinced that Scrabble is worldwide and all of that. And as the people from the hotel were clearing out and cleaning the room that we had been in playing the tournament sure. over four days or five days, they were setting up signs for the people coming in. And there were a thousand people coming in to play dominoes. Dominoes, wow. Dominoes. Yeah. And so I asked around after that. And I always knew that there was a world interest in playing poker. And there's a major tournament every year held in Vegas mm -hmm. uh, with a prize of like a million dollars for poker players. And there are tournaments for people with all other kind of interests. Well, when you see a group of 500 Scrabble players and they're coming from all of these different directions, it's like you become aware that there has to be somebody or some group that organizes all of this. And so uh, I got in it, into it a little deeper by finding out. Now, in order to go to that Scrabble tournament, it was sponsored by, and this was in the early 1990s, a group called National Scrabble Association, NSA. The National Scrabble Association at that time was a group that was licensed to oversee Scrabble clubs and tournaments. Okay. Um, the game at that time, I believe it was owned by uh, Milton Bradley. And Milton Bradley owns many, many games. And when it came to Scrabble, they owned Scrabble, but they didn't want to take the time to do it in-house. Okay. So they hired somebody. And they hired John Williams and Company, which was a PR firm in, based in 
New York City. And John ran the tournaments, or his people ran the tournaments, and set up a structure of clubs. Okay. Um, I learned that in order to have a club, a club had to have a director, and NSA sanctioned people who were interested in becoming directors. So that was a natural for me. I like to organize things. So I got involved by calling NSA and finding out that to be a director, all you had to do was pay a $10 fee, take a test on the rules of the game, and if you pass the test, they were, would certify you, okay. and they would give you a club number, and then you were free to go set up clubs and to run tournaments uh, in accordance with their structure. Okay. So that's what I did in the early 1990s. It may have even been in 89 that I did this. The test. The test. And uh, I became... We're losing your sound. Oh. Uh, how's that? That's better. Okay. So I... Uh, took the test, and they designated me as Club 350. And if you go back over time, you'll see Club 350 on clubs, on tournaments. I did the whole uh, gamut of what was available. Uh, to run a tournament, I had to submit a request to NSA six months in advance, and they would put the information in their newsletter. Now, if you remember 1989, if you were alive and plugged in back then, uh, there was, still wasn't any internet back then. And so everything was done with hard copies and with flyers and things of that sort. So I would submit a flyer telling them I'm going to run uh, a tournament in La Pierre, Michigan. It uh, was called the Coach House. And the location was the very first stagecoach stop. Wow. In the state, in the state of Michigan uh, between Port Huron and Chicago. And in the mid 1800s, this was the place where the coach, uh, the stage coach stopped to pick up and drop people off. And it was in a building that looked like a huge house. And it was like a bed and breakfast, even where people stayed over. And downstairs was a big dining room. And I thought that would be attractive to draw people to a tournament. Sure. There were other people out there that were directors, just like myself. And we were a very creative bunch. We planned our tournaments at places that would help us draw people. In addition to being knowing you're going to a place where you can find all these Scrabble people. So some other major places, or not major, but places that I thought would draw people. There was a little town near uh, near Brighton, Michigan, okay, which is maybe 60 miles northwest of Detroit. The name of the town was Hell, H-E-L-L. -L. Yes. Heard so of it. I ran a tournament in hell. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think my PR statements was come to hell or you're going <laughs> Scrabble is going to hell. I things love like that. Um, I ran a tournament at Proud Lake, Michigan, which was a campground. And 
it was a weekend tournament and when people came their accommodations were we had two big dormitories so one for the men and one for the women i didn't realize when i planned that tournament that number one it first of all it would attract people outdoor people sure who like to play scrabble but when you stayed in a dormitory that accommodated 50 60 people there were two or three people in there that snored so loud <laughs> <laughs> the other scrabble players couldn't get a good night's sleep oh my gosh and so i had never even imagined that kind of problem sure and so even though a lot of these tournaments were really a lot of fun and were very creative, uh, a lot of other situations cropped up. Um, to give you an idea of some other little silly things that happen, um, do you know that there are some people that are Scrabble players or crossword players or domino players that can sit and play game after game after game like nonstop. Um, and I can't imagine it, but you can't yeah. imagine it. Well, there are a lot of people like that. And I just wrote about in one of my blogs a man that I met in the early 90s, what happened was I had just played a turn. It was your, your sound. I think your um, sound is messed that better. Up. No, no, try it no. again. How about now? There, you're better again now. Okay. I'm trying to keep my hands off of it. <laughs> well, I had just won uh, a division in a tournament in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. I think I was in division three or four, but as the winner of the division, it got reported in the local news media. And so often little stories are picked up by other local players, uh, by other local newspapers. So I get home and I was living that time uh, out on the lake in Union Lake, Michigan. Right. Mm -hmm. And there was a local paper that came out once a week called the Spinal Column. And the Spinal Column would pick up on information about local residents. So they printed a story, and like newspapers frequently do, they didn't print exactly the truth. They called me a world champion of Scrabble. Oh, okay. wow. Well, it didn't take long. Two, three days later, I get a telephone call because it gave my name and my street and all sure. that. So I get a call from this total stranger, and he tells me that he's the best player in the state of Michigan. Oh, my. He challenged me to a game. So uh, I said, sure, I'll play you. And he goes on to tell me that he is a chaplain at the local hospital in Pontiac, Michigan, which is only about 10 miles away. His name is Andrew Ali. And I had never heard of him before. And when you're a competitive Scrabble player, you pretty much know who all the other top players are. So I had no idea of what I was going to run into. And he wanted to, this to happen immediately. So we planned it the next afternoon. And he decided that it would be easiest for me to come to the hospital. We'll find the cafeteria. Anyone's welcome to be in there. They're open 24 hours. So we'll sit down and play a game. So I got there and we played our first game. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. He had just completed his day's work. And uh, he played pretty well. 
And um, I won the first game by a modest 35 points. And anytime I played one of those crazy Scrabble words, like Engui or Ekpuili, <laughs> he challenged it and he, you know, made a face, you know, what is that? But when I played it, he seemed to take it in like a sponge and he remembered it. And some of the words I played in game one, he played in a later game. Wow. So he, he really had the ability and, you know, the smarts to do that sort of thing. Well, after the first game finished, I was ready to pick up and go. But he says, no, I want to play another one. So we cleared the board, shook the tiles. We did game two. And he did the same thing at the end of the game. So we played game three and game four. Now it's like seven o'clock in the evening. I'm getting hungry. He says, let's play longer, but I know you're hungry. I'll buy you some dinner here. So we're in the cafeteria. <laughs> we had a decent dinner. And then we, we played right through dinner. And then we played more and more and more. And finally, you know, we're both rubbing our eyes and yawning at one <laughs> another. It's four o'clock in the morning. Wow. He's got to be back at work at 730. <gasps> I wasn't, I didn't have a day job at that time. So it meant nothing to me. Right. But anyways, we, I said, okay, this is enough. Four o'clock in the morning, been playing 12 hours. We had played 17 games. He won five of the 17, which is very respectable. And uh, so we decided it was time. But he wouldn't let me go yet. He wanted me to commit to the next time we could meet to play. And from that date forward, Andrew and I, Oh, we became tight friends. Uh, we played hundreds of games, usually 10 or 12 minimum at a, se at a session. He would come to my house. I would go to his house. I talked him into and showed him the club system. And so he joined the club. Um, I invited him to come along to tournaments. He did that, and it was just a great time. And I thought he was the only one, but no, he wasn't. Through the club, I would tell people and uh, how he and I played these long sessions. And so Rodney told me how he played long sessions with Paul. And Virginia told me how she played long sessions with Eunice. And so I got the feeling that it wasn't just me, it was a lot of people. And if this was happening in and around Detroit, I'm sure it was happening in Chicago, sure. in New York, in LA, in Florida, in a lot of other places. Well, I had been running these little tournaments. I decided that I'm going to try something which I thought was very different. I took and I put a tournament in a hotel and I got permission from the hotel where they gave me the room. I, in turn, would um, advertise that they have provided the room. Okay. Any and all funds that were created would go to a charity. Okay. Well, I got this idea in the spring of the year. And one of the things that I always watched in September on Labor Day weekend right. was Jerry Lewis and Jerry's kids. Right. And this was at a Sheraton Inn Hotel in Southfield, Michigan. They were going to help sponsor this tournament dedicated to Jerry's kids. And I made the tournament a 24 game tournament played in 24 hours. Oh, wow. 
I set up rules that you were allowed to sleep between games. <laughs> <laughs> you could eat or use the restroom between games. And you had to be there for the whole 24 games if you sure. signed on. I had no idea if anybody would sign on. I ended up with 40 players. I ended up getting most of the players were local, but I had a few Canadian players, including a couple people who I'd met in the Toronto club who were friends of mine and Scrabble players, and they came to play. Uh, there was a man who lived outside of Dallas, Texas. Wow. And he was a big fan of Jerry's kids. He not only flew up there for the tournament, but he made a huge cash contribution to the charity. How wonderful. And we raised, oh, I don't know, maybe $2,000, $2,500. And we all had the luxury of playing this uh, marathon Scrabble tournament. Since that time, there have been many other Scrabble tournaments like that. I ran one or two others like that myself. When I first moved to LA, I contacted a Holiday Inn and I contacted Ronald mcdonald house which provides housing for kids who are in the ronald mcdonald hospital right and we raised many hundreds of dollars for them i did another one to benefit the firefighters of california all of the tournaments that i ran for charity were not necessarily long tournaments. Oh, this tournament that I ran in California for Ronald McDonald House. By the time I ran the tournament, I had played in many of the local clubs in and around Los Angeles. So many local players did attend. One gal, her first name was Pat. She came to the tournament. And she was kind of a frail type of person. And it was a big surprise to me that she was going to come to a 24-hour event. At the end of 23 games and 23 hours, with one game and one hour left, she came up to me and she said, Gary, I have to quit. I can't take it anymore. Oh my gosh. Oh no. Can you imagine getting that close to the finish line and just throwing in the towel? No, I, I, I would have found a way to make yeah. it through. Yeah. Me too. I was so surprised. And because she made the group odd in a number of players, someone else couldn't play the last game. And since I was one of the players, I sat out so the others could go ahead sure. and play. I would, I can't imagine running a marathon, but if I was that close to the end, I think I would get on my hands and knees and yeah. crawl to the finish line. Exactly. exactly. And, you know, even if she had just sat there and gone to sleep on her board yeah. and <laughs> allowed her opponent to beat to her. Yeah. You know, you could say, I played in this tournament. Right, exactly. So there were all of these different kinds of events. I was also probably the first one to organize a Scrabble tournament on a cruise ship. This was in the early 1990s, and I put one on carnival cruises to the Mediterranean, and the tournament was played primarily while the ship was at sea. Okay, sure. Um, once we got to a port, people wanted to go out 
and experience the port. Sure. I ran two or three of those tournaments. And then when I first moved to LA through our brother, Joel, I met his friend, Peter Salazi. And Peter was a um, private secretary, I would guess you would call him, for Mr. Sam Zell out of yes. Chicago, who owned the steamboat line on the Mississippi. Uh, the Mississippi, the Mississippi Bell, the American Bell, and I put a tournament on that ship. And that was magical. If anybody out there has the funds and wants to go on a romantic getaway, go on the Mississippi Steamboat. We sailed from uh, New Orleans north to Memphis and then back to New Orleans with a lot of stops along the way on the Mississippi River. One of the reasons I picked that was that I was not really good on the ocean with Carnival Cruises. In fact, while I was on the ocean, I was pretty sick. I was seasick. And I took the shots and I had the wristbands and I took Dramamine and I tried all those things. But for me, it didn't work. But on the river, you don't get the same kind of waves. Right. And so the steamboat was perfect. So all of these different events that I created were under the auspices of National Scrabble Association. When I got out to California, I had, and I left Michigan, I abandoned all of my clubs in Michigan. And I didn't want them just to close down. So I found a very capable Scrabble player who was interested in taking over what I had created. And I gave them in, to Carol Ravishandran. Carol was a very good Scrabble player and she was a very good organizer. She not only took them over, but she continued them and she ran more tournaments and she added her own creativity and uh, did very well. So now I got out to California and I had nothing. I started at attending all of these clubs. Sure. And Los Angeles had a, was like a hub of Scrabble clubs. I found that I could attend a different Scrabble club almost seven days a week if I was willing to drive, oh, 30, 40, 50 miles. Sure. But if you've ever driven in Los Angeles. <laughs> That's a two-hour drive. <laughs> 30 miles is, right. could be a two-hour drive for sure. And so most of those clubs were held in the afternoon or early evening. So I would set out early for, to go to the club. Um, I would get somebody somewhere, let's say at... Um, say the club started at 5 p.m. I would drive so I would get there at 3 p.m. So I would beat the rush hour. I'd go to a movie, I'd go to dinner, I'd play the club, the club ended at 10. Well, after nine o'clock, there is no rush hour in LA. Everybody's home by that time. Sure. It's, the roads are still busy, but it's not stop and go. And so it would be a straight drive back home. So that's how I ran my day. I, as I visited clubs and I saw other directors getting tired and ready to abandon their clubs, I raised my hand, I stepped in. And before you know it, within one or two years, I had two or three clubs going and then I started running tournaments and everything was building up to how I had it back in Michigan. Sure. 
And then something happened in the early 2000s. Um, Milton Bradley had sold out to Hasbro. Hasbro was now the owner of the game. They were still using John Williams to run the club, to oversee the running of the clubs and tournaments. Um, Hasbro wanted to get out of, really get rid of that. It was costing them money and they probably weren't getting a whole lot of uh, revenue sure. from, from this tournament that went on every year. So they looked for someone that they would still license. They would still hold the um, name as a copyright. Okay. And they found somebody. They found... It turned out to be the same guy that gave me all that money for Jerry's friends. His name is Chris Cree. And Chris sort of bought Scrabble, the use of the Scrabble name, the right to run tournaments and clubs. Okay. And he was one of the top players in the country. And he called the name of his group N-A-S-P-A, NASPA, North American Scrabble Players Association. Okay. Now, even though he called it an association, it was a private enterprise. And when you own a business, you want to run it your way. I have no idea how much he paid for it, but he wanted to run it his way. Now, there had been, while NSA ran the group, there were as many as, I would guess, 25,000 players that affiliated and played in, paid in annual dues to the group. Okay. And so... Chris had in his mind to just roll it over to keep it going the same way. But there were other people who were players that didn't like some of his um, rules, okay. some of the ways he wanted right. to administer it. And they started to make waves. They got into verbal disagreements and um, he was going to require, and I, I think in SA he had a tariff. Every time I ran a tournament, I had to pay a fee to NSA, which was per game. Okay. And I didn't mind that. And I would set the structure accordingly. Right. So his tariff was going to be 50 cents a game for each player in a tournament. It was not out of line, but some of these people objected. And um, all of a sudden there was this big argument and there was people taking sides. And then there were some people that said, I don't want to get involved with arguing. I just want to play Scrabble. Right, yeah. Um, the group that opposed Chris, the, uh, the largest group, included a lot of very of the top, tough Scrabble players. They said, they're going to go off and fop, you know, have their own group. They called themselves G W G P O. Word Game Players Organization. Okay. Okay. They didn't want to start at the very beginning and write all the rules of the game. Sure. So they adopted the same rules that Scrabble always had. Okay. They adopted the same word list that Scrabble players always had. 
So now you had these two groups side by side. You had NASPA and WGPO. Got it. Okay. So there are politics and everything. And it got pretty ugly for a while. WGPO wasn't interested in money. So they sort of made it, um, there is no tariff. If someone did did a tournament, they didn't have to pay any 50 cents of game fees. So those tournaments could offer bigger prizes. They still left it up to the tournament director and they called me, do I want to be a director? I, at the time, I was a director for NASPA because I had been a director for NSA and NASPA said that if you're one of our directors, you cannot also, you can't be a director in two organizations. Okay. So they're sort of protecting their back. Right. And they don't want me to steal people and send them to WGPO. Sure. So initially, I did not make the move to WGPO. Um, But there came a time when I was running an event and I didn't want to charge my players the fee. But people still wanted to get the benefit on their rating. So I agreed to run it as WGPO. Well, the first thing I received was a nasty phone call and a nasty letter telling me I couldn't do that. And I told them that I was already, I told NASPA, I was already committed to do this event. And the advertising had been out there. And if they wanted me to give up NASPA, wasn't sure I wanted to, but I would have to because I made a commitment. So they sort of bent the rules for me. They said, I can go ahead and run that one event, but I could do no others and still be one of their directors. Well, I never really got any benefit from NASPA. And at this time, it became clear that the players themselves could play NASPA tournaments, could play WGPO tournaments. As a player, NASPA didn't hold it against them. Wow. And so WGPO, at first, I thought they would die off in a year because they weren't even allowed to use the word Scrabble. Look at their name, Word Game Players Organization. Why would Scrabble players even know they were Scrabble? And so they did somehow find ways to let people know. And, oh, I would think today NASPA might have 5,000 members. WGPO probably has 1,000 members. But even though they only have 1,000, it's a very viable, very active group. And many of the people of, that have the means make donations to WGPO to cover their overhead, which isn't very much. And so they too sponsor clubs and sponsor tournaments sure. and uh, they have some of the very best players in the country that are members who were so turned off by NASPA that they really don't involve the NASPA players. After I ran that first cruise tournament, a few other people tried to run cruise tournaments. And one of the uh, teams that runs the cruise tournament There are two players out of Phoenix, Larry Rand and Barbara Van Allen. They are a couple. And they run as many as six or eight cruises 
all over the world. Wow. And they're appealing primarily to people that like Scrabble, want to travel the world, and have the funds to do it. Did you say? Because most of those tournaments are not inexpensive. Um, oh, I would think that the average cruise is between three to five thousand dollars for a week or ten days. Right. But I know they've been to Alaska. They've been to the Orient. They've been to Egypt. They've been to the Mediterranean. And uh, those tournaments go on. And if anyone's interested, uh, you can go to WGPO.com and you'll find out about it. You can also join that organization without a fee. All you have to do is write them and say, I'd like to be a member. If you want to join NASPA, there's an annual fee of about $15 a year. Um, the, you're allowed to then play in NASPA tournaments. Um, what else do you get? They have a program that I've talked about called Ziziva. They bought that up from the person who invented it. Ziziva is one of those programs that you put on your computer or in your handheld, and you can punch in your rack. It'll unscramble it for you to show you the words, and it has the whole Scrabble Player's Dictionary. So you can use it as your um, adjudication device uh, while you're playing the game. So that's basically what I wanted to share today about all of these politics that go into it and how something that began just as a simple game at home evolved into a game where people became obsessed with it. Yep. And it's a great learning game. It's a great competitive game. And people still exist at all levels. And some people got turned off by the politics involved. That's easy to happen. You know, easy for that to happen to people. Um, yeah. And especially when you just want it to be something f beginning with fun, okay? Because I'm sure even those who are competitive with Scrabble, um, you're going there for a fun time as well. Um, Absolutely. Because yeah. if you didn't enjoy doing it, it, you know, competing would just fall by the wayside. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see how this evolved. It's also interesting for people to understand that, you know, we all have different interests and we all have different interest levels. And you've talked about this before, about people coming to your club um, because they want to play the game. And when they sit down and realize club is more competitive, and playing at the kitchen table, um, they get a little frustrated. But one of the things that I did this past week was I did one of the things that you suggested, and I made a list of the two-letter words, but I mm -hmm. did it first what I, what I could remember. I didn't look anything up, okay? Yeah. Um, and I think you said there were 107 two-letter words? Yes. And... I only came up with like 98. That's um, great. I, but I kept sitting there, sitting there. I, I was determined to find the rest. Mm -hmm. And I had to go look them up. But I made it into a game. You know, I made it into, hey, instead of playing Scrabble right now, instead of doing a crossword puzzle, I'm going to do this. This is my own little puzzle. And, um, you know, one of the things we talked about in the last podcast was, making it fun because if mm -hmm. you make learning fun you're going to remember those those words or those uh concepts that you came up with so anyone who might want the two-letter list i welcome you to send me an email request it and i will send you the file online and uh, you'll have the 107 words okay 
Well, we look forward to doing this again next week. And for everybody out there, please stay safe um, and wear your mask, social distancing. Um, I just heard right before we went on line today, Gary, that um, the state of Ohio is hitting record numbers of people coming down with COVID. Well, good for you. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> not good for us. Um, oh. We're mandated to wear masks. Um, uh -huh. So please, everybody, stay safe. Um, and that's what my plan is for the weeks to come. So Got it. take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.